go. All right. Well, thanks everybody for taking a little time out of your day. I know everyone's really busy. So I'm giving a talk this uh, Sunday morning at 9 a.m. at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San Rafael, which is sort of a, a meeting place of science and spirituality where meditation meets uh, science of neurobiology, meets quantum physics, um, and various other tag-along concepts. So my talk, I gave a talk last year, um, and this is sort of a, a follow-up talk. This one, uh, I sort of went through a few different titles when I was trying to come up with a title. Reconciling Special Relativity with Quantum Mechanics. That's pretty much what we're going to do, but that's not what I landed on. What does a photon do during its coffee break? Well, it wasn't quite serious enough. Out with the past and the present and the future. That was another concept we're going to hit. But what I landed on was um, time and retroactive event determination. It's a bit drier, but that's, that's really the title of what my work is about. So um, we're going to be looking at the physics of what I call retroactive event determination. And the, the, the conference itself is focused on time this year, so we're really paying attention to that aspect of it. So last year at the Science and Non-Duality Conference, I, I presented two different postulates. These are the central part of my theory. So if you understand these, you get the whole thing, but uh, don't expect to understand it right away. Events you haven't observed are undetermined. You like to think, because everything that you observe is always in a definite, determined state. So you like to think that everything is that way. But what this is saying is that events you haven't observed, you have no information about. And so you can't make a definite statement about what state things are in if you're not observing them. And the second postulate that goes with that is that there's no overall bird's eye view of everything. There's no person or, or thing that can look down on everything from every perspective. You have to choose a perspective. In other words, you take your perspective on the world and you define what's, what's definite from your perspective, and that's what's definite from your perspective. If you switch to someone else's perspective, they're going to have a different set of things that are definite or not definite. So for instance, Kelly Frakes is in the uh, uh, Quad Cities office. And I am not observing her. I haven't observed her maybe since last Tuesday when I called her on the phone and we talked about a ticket. So since that point in time, her uh, state is actually undetermined from my point of view. She could be doing any number of different things in any number of different possible timelines. And we'll get to some images of that. Um, but from my point of view, all those are in a superposition of possibilities, not in a definite state. Now from her point of view, obviously, her state is definite, right? She's having a definite experience. But from my point of view, there is no overall view that you can prove to say one person is definite and one person is not. From my perspective, she's undetermined. And from her perspective, I'm undetermined. And you can't combine those views into a coherent combination. So we're stuck with this idea that you can only you have to describe things from a single perspective at a time. And this concept of retroactive event determination comes out of that. So let's look at what that is. This is a, a cool little diagram. I'm just showing this concept of um, timelines branching over time. You've got a person starting at a certain time, and then uh, they make a choice and they go into two different paths. And then uh, those choices also branch into other different possible choices they could have made. And after a long time, you've got many, many, many different possible timelines out in the future that they're in. So this is the, the, a diagram of that kind of concept. Um, and, and in this diagram, you can see this person um, goes through their life. This is a much longer span. They get married in this timeline, they have kids in this timeline. But in, in this timeline, they get married and it looks like their partner dies or something like that. And so you know, they end up alone. And then over here, they never get married and they have a profession, but they never get married. So there's all these different possible outcomes of their life that are not determined from the beginning. And we're going to show that actually you can see this red line is uh, darker. That's because this is the one he's saying they actually ended up in. The other ones became not valid anymore. Undetermined, or or uh, this undetermined set of possibilities collapsed into one possibility in the end. We're going to look at how that would work. This is the same concept on a graph. You've got time going up and down. Um, you've got an event, uh, a person S. Say so This is like Kelly Frakes. And here I am, I'm person P. And last Monday I talked to her on the phone and I make a measurement. So she's in a definite state because I've talked to her and gained information about what she's doing. But since that time, let's say she splits into two different states. In one state, she... Uh, takes a look at, it, at the system and finds a bug. Okay, she finds a bug and is in system and in history one. In history two, uh, she checks the same thing and there is no bug. So she's got no bug to report. And then maybe Tiffany comes along, these are the people I work with on a regular basis, and she says, uh, she talks with Kelly, and therefore is making a measurement of Kelly's state, right? And so when she does that, you might think that she's gonna collapse 
Kelly into a definite state, because she's making a measurement of what Kelly's state is. But from my perspective over here, I don't have any kind of information about either of them. And so they both end up in a superposition of states. In one state, we have Kelly having found a bug, and Tiffany coming to her and hearing about the bug, and then maybe making a phone call to me down the road and saying, uh-oh, we got a bug. And over here, there is no bug in the system. Uh, so Kelly didn't find anything. Tiffany finds her, and, and they're very happy, and they call us with a bunch of praise in this history. Okay? So there's two different possible outcomes. They're both in a superposition, because I haven't made any kind of measurement yet. Even though it seems like the actual bug happened down here, right? But even up at this point, it's still open to uh, falling into place either of those two ways. So here at a later time, five, I make a measurement uh, of one of these two states. I don't know which one I'm going to get. And quantum mechanics says it's, it's pretty much random. You get one or the other. But e even if that's the case, let's say I randomly get two, what does that mean about all these steps here? These were in a superposition of possibilities until the end here. And so all of these steps, which are all choices along the way, become retroactively determined when I make my measurement. They were, not, they were in a superposition at time three, and it's not until time five that even the event at time one becomes definite. Up until that point, it's, it's in an undetermined superposition. And that's what I call retroactive event determination. You're determining the event after the fact. Now, you're not changing the event. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But you're not changing something that already was true. You're saying it was in a superposition of possibilities, and you're determining retroactively which one it ended up in. So retroactive event determination, just as review, is based on your perspective. That's fundamentally important. And um, you know, Kelly and I are going to have different ideas of what's determined and what's, what's in a superposition. Determined and superposition being like opposites of each other. Um, and the second part is timelines of things around you become retroactively determined, and not retroactively changed, but retroactively determined when you interact with them. So that's the general concept from last year. Um, so now we'll get into the 2011 talk. And I'm uh, happy to take questions at the end, or if you're really st stuck, let me know. But um, what I'm going to say in this talk is special relativity and quantum mechanics conflict. Okay, fundamentally. And um, we've known about this for a long, long time. Um, since they were brought into existence. But the resolution is that the state of a light photon is undetermined unless you're observing it. That's exactly the statement from the previous talk, right? So that previous talk actually resolves this issue between special relativity and quantum mechanics. So we're going to say the state of a light photon is undetermined unless you're observing it. And the conclusions that we're going to draw are that the past, present, and future are terms that are no longer really relevant for us. The actual relevant terms are observed and determined, or unobserved and undetermined. That's what's going to become more important in understanding what the world out there is actually like. Usually we use past and we say, well, past is already determined, and therefore it's fixed. But that's no longer the case. So we've got to focus on observed and determined rather than past. So here we go. We're going to do a little brief foray through uh, special relativity and quantum mechanics. Einstein's special relativity bases all its conclusions on the assumption of light traveling at 300 million meters per second all the time. This is a really strange postulate because it means that even if you run to catch up with light, it'll still be moving at 300 million, million meters per second. It's like the way your dreams are always the same distance away from you, right? <laughs> you know, you're always, no matter how fast you run, you never catch up to it. And that's saying, that this is fundamentally, that this is called the light postulate. Without this, you have no special relativity. So this is fundamental to it, and it's basically saying all the time, this is what's going on, whether or not someone's watching or if we're making a measurement. But then quantum mechanics came along about 20 years later and said quantum mechanics shows that we can't make definite statements about things between measurements. It's also fundamental to quantum mechanics. So you can see that these can't both be true. You can't both say, you know, I'm not going to make a statement about something when I'm not observing it, but I'm going to just say that light is always traveling at the same speed, regardless of who's observing it. You can't say both those things. So there's a conflict between those. Um, and this, the resolution is a light particle state is observer dependent. So here we got someone on Earth observing the light, and, uh, and that's when it becomes determined or definite. And this is, in fact, what special relativity has always implied. I'm just going to use some very basic math in special relativity. And here it is. <laughs> so um, the first step is light does not experience time. This is Lorentz's transformation. And it basically says that the time is measured by me and the length of some distance measured by me, an observer, is related to the time measured by 
a moving observer, in this case we're going we're to say light is the moving observer, um, by this equation. And if you say light is a moving observer, what you get is time would measure zero, I mean, sorry, light would measure zero time in, a given, in any given experiment. No matter what I measure for the distance and time between events myself, it's always going to give me that delta t prime equals zero. So this basically says time as registered by the light itself is zero. Time does, our light does not experience time. We're experiencing differences in time between the events in our lives. But the light that's bouncing around the room is not experiencing light, uh, time in the same way at all, in fact. And um, the same can be said about space. We're not going to talk much about space. But space and time are both undefined from the point of view of light. And you're going to learn about the, uh, the uh, Minkowski diagram. This is a famous diagram. You've got time on the vertical axis. So as time goes on, you kind of move up the axis automatically, right? Um, and then space is just one dimension of space. We've got left and right. You can move left and right on this graph to show space. And you've got BART sort of moving up the graph. Um, and these are two events, you know, like maybe two firecrackers going off at the same time. Now, these are at the same time, right, because they're at the same height on the graph. So. From, from the point of view of someone that's still relative to these, these are measured at the same time. And this 45 degree angle here is a special means of measuring simultaneity in, uh, in special relativity. And it basically leaves you with the conclusion that E prime and F prime, which is what BART measures the events at, is the same. You know, they're, they're simultaneous, right? So if BART's still relative to them, they're simultaneous. But if BART starts to move kind of at a very large speed, he's going to find that the same method of of drawing this out gives you f prime slightly before e prime. And so what happens is when a moving observer goes, uh, when a moving observer is moving towards the events at a high speed, he sees mildly jumbled events, e prime and f prime. They're no longer simultaneous. And this is a well-known conclusion from special relativity. Um, if he moves really fast, and we're going to say even at the speed of light, these events become so jumbled that it becomes meaningless to talk about the order of events. And this is just a, a sort of a, a proof that time becomes meaningless. If you're moving as fast as light does at the speed of light, then time becomes meaningless. Now, nothing can move at the speed of light. You know that, right? Nothing can move at the speed of light except what? Light. light. So we're talking about what does light actually experience, and we're saying, well, it can't experience any kind of order of events or any kind of time whatsoever. Because not only this diagram, but the previous equation shows that that doesn't make any sense to speak of light having a sense of time. So the same conclusion, stated, restated, time and space become infinitely jumbled and are undefined from the perspective of light. light. Light is timeless and spaceless. So what does that mean for us? Because light appears to move between events. Light leaves a projector, bounces off the screen, goes to your eyes, and those three different events are all separated in time. Right? We, we, me we can measure when each of those things happen. And they're different times, and we can measure the distance it traveled. And we're always going to measure a distance, um, a, a certain distance which is related to the time of travel. And that gives us speed, it's distance over time, which gives us the speed of light. In all cases, every time we measure in an experiment the distance that light traveled in a given amount of time, it's always going to give us the same speed, 300 million meters per second. Well, if you plug in that result we had before to the same Lorentz transformation, this is saying that time is measuring zero, uh, I'm sorry, light, this is the light here, is measuring zero time. Remember that conclusion? What that gives you is a very, very simple result that's deceptively simple. It says that, well, the distance over the time as measured by me, the observer, is going to equal c. This is the speed of light. It's a very simple conclusion, but let me interpret it for you. It says that Light appears to have moved a distance L in time t for someone like me who's measuring it. Every time I measure it, I'm going to find that it traveled a distance L in a time t. It's going to appear to have moved. Even though from light's point of view, it's experiencing no time at all. This is really bizarre. How can light experience no time and no space? And yet we perceive as if it's moving, and we measure these time separations and space separations as the light moves. That is the fundamental strangeness of, of this topic that we're talking about today. And this tense is very important. Light appears to have moved when we make a measurement. And this is how we're resolving that conflict. When we make a measurement, light appears to have moved at a certain speed. 
But in between those measurements, we don't have enough information. We don't have any information to say about what it's actually doing. Actually. So, we're going to take one more step. Step three, quantum mechanics also says that the future is undetermined, which we all pretty much hope for, because that means we actually have some free choice in the world. And the quantum mechanics says that as a postulate. Um, so let's see what that really implies here. We know that the now is fixed. Like event A is like right now. In this room, we're all observing each other, and we are all fixed relative to each other, right? And let's say some future B is not allowed to be predetermined. So it's, the future is open to change or to, to uh, our own choices. So the, but the light that is bouncing from there off the board into each of us in different ways is already in the future. You see why I say that? Because there's no, it has no sense of time. It's connecting all points in space and time simultaneously in a way. There's no separation in time between any events for light. So from its perspective, it's already in the future. And it's still in the past. And it's in the present. So how is it possible for it to connect you know, these events from now into the future without predetermining what they are? if it's already there. And the only way that I can see to do that is to have it be branching into a bunch of different possibilities. So you start from you know, the now, which is fixed, and light already exists in all these other possible branches. But we're not there yet. We're still here. And as we go through time, we can make choices and go down one path or another, and the light will retroactively collapse into that state with us. And that's the only way to resolve, as far as I can see, this setup, where light, because light already exists in the future, if we believe what we've said so far. So what does that mean? What does light actually do between measurements? That's the real question, right? So I think it's just hanging out having a good time. But um, we have, uh, it's not just definite or well-defined, right? That's what we said so far, between measurements. And we're concluding that the branches of it spread out like a tree representing the possible paths that light could take. So here on the left is the now, and in the future, light is branched out, and it's already existing in all these possible futures. In all your possible futures, light is already there in all those possible states. And you just haven't caught up to it yet, because, and you're going to decide which of these paths you end up on, and which of these paths become actualized. These are not actual paths, these are possible paths. So the light is existing in this possible futures, in all these possible futures, that are not actualized yet. So here's a, an example diagram. You've got the sun, and you've got a light beam that gets emitted from the sun, and it branches out into all these different possible paths. Maybe some of these include bouncing off dust particles or any, any different possible thing that can make it take different paths. But it's not determined until some measurement is made of it at some point in the future. And then, remember, it's only determined relative to the person making the measurement. So if I'm a person on the Earth with a telescope, and I do measure light from the sun, that means all of these possible um, histories, well, which, which all exist simultaneously, must collapse into the single one in which I actually measured it. And so you can see that this point, for instance, is retroactively determined. Because it could have been, when this point actually was passed by the light, it could have also been in any of these. It's not until I make a measurement that this point becomes definite or fixed. And that's retroactive event determination. So the path of the light is retroactively determined by the measurement made at the Earth with the telescope. And again, just to show you that diagram, you have um, all the different possible paths collapsing into one. And because this is all uh, retroactively determined, these other ones go away. So what does this say about time? Just to close up here, uh, past, present, and future become less meaningful. What we're really talking about is important is if something is determined, in other words, if it's been observed by you, then it is fixed and not open to any kind of influence. But if it's undetermined and unobserved by you, then it's, that's a more helpful concept, because then it is open to some kind of influence by you still. Um, for instance, events in the past and present that you have not observed are not yet determined. So even the past is open to influence in some way here, um, which is not what would have happened in our standard model of what time is, where time is, the past is always fixed. Um, but of course, this is only defined from my perspective. We have to keep that in mind as part of our discussion. So as a personal example, this is one of the things that got me thinking about this heavily. Uh, in the 2008 election, I, I volunteered quite a bit. 
And um, there was a, a moment where I had this question in my mind as to whether, you know, I, I felt like it was important to me to make phone calls in support of what I believed in, you know, in order to, in order to perpetuate my own and to show the meaning that I, that was important to me, to my commitment to, to my results. And I felt like that was going to have an influence on the campaign. But then I got home one day, and an election that happened in Ohio for a primary or something, and it was at 2 p.m. CST, so, and it was now 6 p.m. Pacific time, it was much later. But I hadn't watched the news yet, and I thought to myself, well, I haven't made any phone calls in the past couple days, but I really care about this. I'm going to go ahead and make a bunch of phone calls just to show my own internal commitment to this cause, and, and then I'm going to watch TV. And my answer to this, which is open to a lot of debate, but this is, the, this is what started me on this path, is that yes, so long as I do not turn on the TV and watch the outcome of the election, it is still open to be influenced by the meaning of my actions. So what seems to be in the past is still open to be influenced. And you can summarize it in this way. Events don't actually happen when they happen. They fall into place retroactively when you make a measurement at the end. So the events that you actually think are happening right now out in the world are not actually going to become fixed until you make a measurement of them later. And up until that point, they're actually open to some kind of influence which we're not going to get into what, how you would influence them, but that is part of where I'm trying to go in the study. So some typical concerns that come up are um, solipsism, which is the idea that the world is only meaningful from my perspective. It's all about me, which uh, is an is a understandable concern, but I've, I've gone to great lengths in my papers to show that that's not actually what's, what we're saying. Um, it seems that way, though, if you just look at this for a little bit. Decoherence is a standard uh, way in which physicists say that um, macroscopic objects lose their superposition state. And so I have to address that because I'm saying that they, macroscopic objects like cars and planes and stuff don't lose their superposition state. They stay in superposition. So I address both of those. But the one I want to talk about with you here is, does this require a conscious observer? And I would say no. Um, everything so far has sort of re revolved around these ideas of conscious people making measurements, but it can be... Uh, hi, Carlos. <laughs> it, can be, um, it can be anything. It can be a rock. It can be a stick, it can be a, an air molecule or a dust particle in the path of the light that affects it. From, from the dust particle's point of view, it will say, well, the light that just bounced off me is definite. It's in a definite state. I just measured it. But from my, the observer like me on Earth, I would say both the dust particle and the light are now in a superposition once they've interacted. So anything can make a measurement. Any interaction is considered a measurement. And it's only... Um, but it, humans have the ability to... Uh, talk about their experiences and think about them, which is why it seems like we're special. Um, so this is, this is the same idea. That, you know, here's the light coming from the sun. It bounces off a dust particle on this path, and on this path it doesn't bounce off the dust particle. Oh, no, uh, no, it takes one path or the other path, and then the dust particle comes along and either bounces off it or it doesn't. Well, the dust particle and the, and the light are both in a superposition of possibilities for me until I make a measurement later, at which point only one of those histories collapses into place. So what I said is special relativity and quantum mechanics conflict. The resolution is it's the state of a light photon is undetermined unless you're observing it. And uh, past, present, and future are no longer relevant. Rather, we've got to talk about what's been observed and determined versus what's been unobserved and undetermined. And um, this idea is something I'm working towards. Uh, in this concept, um, we have a certain set of things that are still available to be determined. What, what is the set of possibilities that's still available to, to come to me in a given instant? That's what I call the library of heaven. It's like, it's like a library. You can go, into the, go in there and pick a certain book off a shelf, but not every possibility is open to you. You can only take certain ones that are available. Well, what's the point? Get involved in your life. You have far more influence than you can imagine, and it is never too late because the past is not even determined yet in many situations. There you go. Thank you. Hooray!